Hello and welcome to the world today. I'm Millicent Walker. First, the headlines. A journalist at Ukraine's Radio Liberty station killed in one of several Russian missile strikes on Kyiv. The United Nations reports more than 3,000 people have been lost in sea crossings to Europe in 2021. Plus, Kenya holds state funeral for former president Kibaki, who died last week at the age of 90. Thank you for joining us. Vera Kiryich, a journalist at Ukraine's Radio Liberty, was killed in one of several Russian missile strikes on Kyiv Thursday. Her body was discovered this morning after a missile struck her home in Ukraine's capital. And this is coming from the radio station. A statement there says uh, that she has been described as a bright and kind person, a true professional. The Russian missile strikes came as UN chief Antonio Guterres was visiting Kyiv for talks with Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky. Moscow has confirmed that it hit Ukrainian targets, but has not commented on the strike on the building. Meanwhile, the head of the Donetsk Regional Military Administration said Russian troops have used phosphorus munitions in eastern village of Slovoyov. While phosphorus is not classified as a chemical weapon under the Chemical Weapons Convention, using it as an incendiary weapon near civilians is illegal. But heavy fighting is continuing eastern Ukraine, where Russian forces are trying to take the entire Donbass. A Ukrainian presidential advisor says Ukraine has taken serious losses, but Russian casualties have been colossal. Here's more in this report. Ukrainian rescue workers today recovered the body of a Radio Liberty producer from under the rubble of a building in Kiev that was hit by a missile. Radio Liberty said in a statement that Vyra Gerich, who had worked in the Kyiv Bureau since February 2018, had been killed after a Russian rocket hit the building she lived in. The death was the first reported in Thursday's missile strike as the head of the United Nations visited Kyiv. Ukrainian officials said two Russian missiles had struck the capital. Russia has not commented on the incident. And while Kiev Mayor Vitaly Klitschko has visited a residential site in the capital where two blasts struck a day earlier, Klitschko said Kiev remained a target for Russian forces and there was risk of further attacks. Kiev still a dangerous place and uh, this Kiev is uh, still the target of Russians. Yes, of course, uh, the capital of Ukraine is a goal uh, and they want to occupy it. They don't have a chance to do it. That thanks uh, for Ukrainian forces, for Ukrainian soldiers. Um, they destroyed the plans of Russians, but uh, we see the risk, huge risk, uh, regular attack. And right now, it's main priority to save the lives of the people. For me personally, and. Uh, we do it the best, but we can't guarantee the next couple of minutes uh, or next couple of hours or next couple of days uh, we have the next rapid attack. In the meantime, UK organization says Russian forces were holding two aid workers in Ukraine. The so, founder uh, of Presidium the, Network, Dominic Brian, gave the, the explanation of how it happened. Lady. On Wednesday afternoon, um, or oh, Wednesday evening, sorry, I got a, a call and messages from contacts of theirs back in England saying that they are missing and we, we believe we know where they are and that they've been taken by Russians. We have had contact with the lady that they were evacuating. Um, south of Zafirosha, and we've had a statement from her to say actually three hours after 
their states to get there on Monday uh, that the uh, Russian soldiers were interrogating her and her family about these two British guys that they picked up, said that they were um, trying to um, trying to, uh, to evacuate, and um, why are they talking to these British spies and things like that. She has now been able to leave, and we had verification this morning that she's in Poland and on her way to the UK. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so, so that's how we know that they've been captured. Elsewhere, the Kremlin has responded today on the U.S. proposal to allow U.S. officials seize Russian assets and use the funds to support Ukraine, saying it would amount to illegal expropriation. President Joe Biden asked Congress for $33 billion to support Ukraine, a proposal that would also let U.S. officials seize more Russian oligarchs' assets, give the cash from those seizures to Ukraine, and further criminalize sanctions, dodging. Also, Russia is preparing for the year's G20 summit in Indonesia, but has not yet decided whether President Vladimir Putin will attend in person or virtually. Joining us right now, a senior lecturer, Department of Political Science and Public Administration, Babcock University, Dr. Michael Ogu. Uh, thank you for joining us on the program. I want to begin with uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who visited Kyiv yesterday and admitted that his own organization, Security Council, failed to prevent or end the war uh, in Ukraine, saying it was it's a source of great frustration. And then two blasts hitting the city while he was there for talks uh, with President uh, Zelensky. Many are calling this a humiliation of all the United Nations stands for. Um, hello, thank you for having me. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll begin from the, last, from, from the last point you raised, which is uh, the visit of Antonio Guterres to Kyiv and the two blasts you know, that rocked the city while he was visiting. Um, while you know, while international organizations you know uh, are not are not very potent in these kinds of issues, you know, um, they basically are diplomatic instruments. You know, they help to encourage, persuade as much as possible um, aggressors and uh, rogue states like Russia is becoming. You know, to to toe the line of diplomacy and reason, and of course, uh, peace. But where that fails, you know, uh, interest, national interest still prevails against the will of these international organizations. So uh, it, is not, it is no surprise that the Security Council could not prevent this war, just like they couldn't prevent several other wars that, you know, they have not supported but have eventually taken place in the past. You know, uh, Russia's, uh, the U.S. invasion of Iran, uh, or sorry, of Iraq, rather, you know, and several other conflicts that have taken place in the past, which the Security Council could not prevent you know, outrightly. Um, so it is not surprise. It is not surprise. It is just reminding us that again we are at the point where we may need to begin to reconsider, you know, reforms of the United Nations, you know, um, organization entirely to make it more um, more potent, uh, especially in cases of this nature, you know. Um, now, I think Russia was trying to make a statement too by the blast that they made on the on the, uh, the blast they made in Kiev while the, um, while the Secretary General was there. You know, Russia, of course, is is trying to make a statement that you know they they are they are not um, intimidated by all these coalitions and alliances that are building up against them. You know, um, of course, they have not successfully been able to take out Ukraine and achieve. You know all that they set out to achieve in Ukraine. Of course, the city of Kiev is still is still under Ukrainian custody, and so that was a major target of, of the Russian forces. You know to seize Kiev, but since that has not happened, uh, you know Russia has not yet prevailed. And so, as as wounded as as they may seem, um, they are still trying to make a statement saying that they are not intimidated. And I think that is what uh, they tried to say with those with those blasts that. Uh, that, that rocked the city while Guterres was there. But I'm sure also that they were very careful not to, you know, not to, to make the strikes very close to the Secretary General because, uh, I mean, it, it would be something else if uh, Guterres was fought anyway by, by, by those strikes. But of course, they're trying to make a statement, and I think their statement has been made loud and clear.
And, and many also wonder what message this is sending, uh, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and what we've seen so far, what it is sending sort of to the uh, Putins of the world. Uh, but we're also seeing that an operation plan to get civilians out of the Azovstal plants uh, in Mariupol, uh, you know, and this is coming 24 hours after the UN chief's visit. This is definitely a good deliverable, isn't it? Yeah, um, I actually forgot to mention that, you know, this, uh, this visit to Kyiv by Guterres was just a few days after, you know, uh, after, uh, of course, a few days after Guterres visited uh, Putin in Russia, I think on Tuesday, earlier this week or so, you know. So, so having, having, having the city of Kyiv hit, you know, while Guterres was there, I mean, shows, shows the kind of person Putin is too, you know, having met with this man just a few days before. And, and perhaps hearing, you know, even if not knowing that he was going to a city like this and then, and then having that, that, that blast, it, it shows the kind of person Putin is, you know. And of course, the Putins around the world, like you put it rightly, you know, um, um, are also getting the news or are, are getting the, the message that all of this is, is, is saying. The world is not going to keep quiet while you know one state tries to bully any other states as as much as they want to you know and even as much as as any state feels insurmountable or informidable you know um uh the world of course will do something to help prevent those kind of bullies and that is that is the message that putin is getting that's 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 what is coming out of all of these alliances that have been formed you know, against Russia in this in this in this scenario, and I think that the message is loud and clear. I mean, leaders must must begin to see themselves as not just responsible to their own interests, but of course have the interests of humanity at heart as well. You know, and I'm not I'm I'm not sure that Russia is going to is going to respect that uh, safe corridor that they're trying to provide in that uh, plant. You know, in, in in the plant incident, I'm sure that Russia would, would still do a lot, if not everything possible, you know, to harm civilians while that corridor is open. So while, 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 yes, there has been a nod and the agreements to provide a safe corridor for civilians to leave that plant, I think it should be taken with a pinch of salt because um, that plant has been on siege for almost I mean, several, several days now, you know, so Russia would not just let go um, without a fight. You know, so um, I, I think I think that that should be taken with a pinch of salt, and um, everything should be done to ensure that more civilians are not put in harm's way, because this looks to me like a trap. And many are trying to understand what indeed the Russian president is thinking at this time. Um, but we've heard NATO say the war could drag on for years. The UK prime minister said at most two years. Um, and on the other hand, you have Russia warning of consequences if the West continues uh, to help and support Ukraine with weapons. Um, What's your take? Uh, President Putin, could he be bluffing in terms of uh, the warning of his consequences? And do you think that this war could last for quite some time? Well, yes, the war would last for quite some time. Now, how long is what we really can't see. Because uh, I, I think in my previous interview here on Channel 2, I mentioned that the parties involved, you know, will be the best um, will be in the best position to determine how long uh, the war would last. Because from all indication, Russia is not winning the war, you know, uh, and of course Ukraine is also uh, has been badly devastated. I mean, Ukraine is is currently a shadow of itself, you know. So they are not also giving up anyway, you know. So so the war will drag on for as long as possible. I'm not sure exactly how many years, you know. So if uh, if, if some are predicting two years, perhaps, you know, but I, I, I want to think that perhaps it might not be dragged on for that long, you know. Um, um, so we cannot, we cannot tell exactly how long it will drag on for. But I think that um, the sanctions that Putin is threatening, you know, for the West if they continue to support, um, I think it's a bluff and it's not a bluff at the same time. It's a bluff in the sense that, oh yes, the West will support whoever it wants to support. You know, U.S. and the rest of these allies will support whoever they want to support. That is also, you know, a kind of foreign policy to um, interest for them. You know, and Putin cannot stop that. You know, and it's not a bluff in the sense that I mean, uh, 
you know, Russia is one of the largest oil exporters, and they can they can decide to uh, sanction other so they can send to sanction other allies by cutting off, you know, just recently they cut off supply of, of gas to Poland and Bulgaria. Bulgaria. I think you know they can they can they can decide to extend that to other allies uh, as as much as possible, and of course cut off other supplies that they also export. Indeed. So in that sense, they are not they are not bluffing, but. Um, I, I mean, there's there's really not so much that they can do with uh, to, to, to actually prevent the West from from supporting whoever they want to support. Dr. Michael Lugu, thank you so much for joining us on the program. He's a senior lecturer, Department of Political Science, Public Administration with Babcock University. Always a pleasure really having pleasure. you join us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, the European Union countries, they have bought 44 billion euros worth of Russian energy from February 24 to April 24. This is according to media reports, citing information from the Independent Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air. Well, according to the lead analyst, the EU country's energy imports from Russia more than doubled in the past two months compared to the same period last year, and higher prices rather than volumes accounted for most of that increase. Well, EU solidarity is being tested after Russia cut off natural gas to member states, Bulgaria and Poland, for failing to comply with Moscow's demand for ruble payments. Deutsche Welle correspondent Chelsea Dulani joins me now on the program for more. Chelsea, the prospect of losing access to Russian gas is dividing EU countries, uh, with some preparing to, to bend to Moscow's demands and others urging resistance. What is the latest? Well, EU countries remain very split on this prospect. The EU has called a blackmail and said that European countries shouldn't um, bend to those demands, that they shouldn't give in to the blackmail. But the other alternative is is very unpalatable for a lot of European countries to lose access to Russian gas, to face the prospect of rationing for industry, for consumers. That is something that uh, could be politically very unpopular in a time where economic growth is already slowing, inflation is already surging. So basically what we're seeing right now is most EU countries um, that are still very dependent on Russian gas start to prepare to pay in rubles. So Bloomberg News has reported that about 10 EU companies have set up Russian uh, ruble accounts with Gazprom Bank in Russia. That's what uh, Putin has demanded. About four companies have already paid in rubles. Um, I think we're going to see more clearly how, how, um, how this plays out at the end of of next month. That's when the majority of these payments are going to be due to uh, Russia for their natural gas. Um, but so far, it does appear that a lot of EU countries uh, would do would end up paying for Russian natural gas and rubles rather than have um, their supply cut off. And Chelsea, the EU has said paying for gas in rubles would violate the bloc's sanctions. Is that still the case? It has not, and that adds a, another layer of uncertainty and um, it, it definitely raises the stakes for a lot of these countries that are facing the prospect of having their gas cut off or to face sanctions from the EU. Uh, basically, what the EU has said is that uh, if you're an EU company, you can't pay in rubles. That is a violation of their current sanctions against Russia because those sanctions prohibit um, EU banks, EU uh, buyers from dealing in, in rubles through the Russian central bank. What we've heard from experts and also from a lot of companies is actually quite quite a bit different. They think that there is a workaround, that there is a way to pay in, in euros. So essentially what uh, a lot of companies and what a lot of sanctions experts have proposed is uh, that companies would open these two bank accounts in Russia and they would pay in euros and then that money would be converted into rubles um, without them having to do it themselves. So technically, EU companies would still be paying in euros, but the end result would be um, rubles for Russia, which is what they want. It's really unclear um, whether that is a violation of EU sanctions uh, and whether Russia would accept that payment. So EU energy ministers are expected to meet next week. They're expected to discuss this potential workaround. Um, the EU is also being pressed to give a more, a more clear line, a more clear response to whether that would be a violation of sanctions. If it 
it is a violation of sanctions, then the EU has been very clear that they would take legal action against these companies for um, for breaking the sanctions that are in place. Um, but it's unclear if that would actually stop EU buyers in the end, because the prospect of um, fa facing a sanctions violation uh, or you know the prospect of, of losing access to uh, natural gas and, and causing these huge economic disruptions, it's unclear which of those is really going to um, to win out for a lot of European countries. Thank you, Chelsea, for that update. Uh, Deutsche Welle correspondent Chelsea Delany with the latest.